Tell me when. Okay. Hello, this is Ed Weiser, uh, Reef Weiser on the Reef to Reef Forum, and uh, today is the second broad broadcast of uh, the uh, SPS Insider Show with Steve Tyree. And uh, Steve, what are we going to be talking about today? Well, Ed, uh, two primary topics. First of all, thanks for uh, inviting me back. It's nice to be on the on your podcast. Um, but uh, during the first podcast, I I mentioned that I'm starting to write a, a fifth book, and uh, I, I was just starting to do the research, and I discovered uh, there's quite a bit of research that's been done by the scientists in the last ten years. So we probably should talk about that because it's really exciting, and. Uh, then, of course, uh, I believe you wanted to talk about uh, uh, SPS pest and, and predators. Right. And so those are the two primary topics. We'll try to keep keep it uh, keep people interested with the two topics instead of one long, boring one. <laughs> so you mentioned you were writing a fifth book. Is uh, is that on cryptic sponges? And uh, how did that how does that uh, connect with SPS corals? Uh, well, actually, um, it turns out that the cryptic sponges, you know, because of this new research that's been done, the, uh, uh, the uh, cryptic sponges are actually an integral component of uh, tropical reefs. Uh, actually, what happens is that the, the autotropes, basically the algae, um, the macroalgae and the uh, symbiotic algae within the coral, zooxanthellae, they uh, produce uh, organic sugars when the, when the sun is up. And uh, what happens is all algae end up producing uh, dissolved organics in the form of slime. It's uh, mucus, mucus. Uh, we see it as coral slime, um, but it actually comes out of all algae. Coralline algae, uh, pear algae, uh, macro algae, they all release dissolved organics. And it turns out that in the past, people had thought that heterotropic bacteria were the primary consumers of uh, the dissolved organics because the reefs are kind of like uh, a self-contained system out in a desert with very little nutrients, uh, desert o ocean, you could say. Um, so basically, um, the uh, slime is produced and the cryptic sponges consume uh, the majority of it. And bacteria are still involved, but they actually are, most of the bacteria are actually inside the sponges. The cryptic sponges a lot of them are loaded with bacteria, very high densities of bacteria. So bacteria are still involved, it's just that they are in symbiosis with the sponges. So you have basically a symbiosis of the coral and, the al and its algae and the sponge and its bacteria. And those two are basically the primary nutrient exchange on uh, tropical reefs. Now, when you, when you talk about a, scriptic, a cryptic sponge, is that like the sponges we see, the big orange uh, pipe sponges or the Barrel sponges, or what? What is a what is a cryptic sponge? Well, a cryptic sponge is basically not what you see for sale. Usually, usually what you see for sale is what the divers collect, and that's out on the exposed side. Those are exposed sponges. I call those exposed sponges. Um, they basically, typically, can harbor uh, symbiotic symbiotic uh, cyanobacteria and stuff like that, but uh, they tend to have less bacteria in them. So they're actually a little bit more. A little bit less heterotropic and a little bit more autotropic uh, because they they have symbionts in them, but uh, they do pump more water through them, um, but they consume less dissolved organics. So uh, what we are primarily concerned with, of course, in a reef, is producing is is handling the slime, the the, the uh, mucus that the algae are giving off, because uh, people don't realize it, but. The SPS corals, especially Acropora, they're releasing slime all day long when the lights are on. And about half of that slime you cannot see because it's actually instantly dissolves into the water. So you can't see it. What you see is mucus, it's just a min minor component of it. So the last thing you want to do actually is, is produce, try to produce slime out of your corals or irritate them to get them to produce slime. Because they, uh, because I, uh, there's a new, uh, there's a, there's an article out on, on the coral slime, and I've actually did some calculations on it, and I determined that, let's say, if you have a typical full-blown stony reef, like a 150-gallon reef, full of acropora, or 180, you typically have about, uh, like a 30-gallon cube of acro, let's say, you know, not solid, but, you know, branching, a 30-gallon cube of acro. Well, if you, the maximum amount of slime that amount of acro can release is one gallon per day. 
So you can imagine a gallon of mucus per day coming out of your coral. I mean, your filtration system will keep up with it for a few days if you got a good one, but a week or two of that and you're in trouble. Um, so you don't want to irritate the corals. It's a real simple rule. Do not irritate the corals. Do not make them to produce slime uh, because it just will tax your filtration system. But in, and it will overload, let's say, the cryptic sponges. But, um, but yeah, but that's uh, basically the, the symbiosis between the, the, the cryptic sponges and the, the coral. And there's less of that with the exposed zone sponges that you were talking about. And so uh, what is the best way to uh, use cryptic, cryptic sponges in a reef tank, per se, in a reef tank? Well, okay, we could get back to the new scientific re research that's been done, and it's really exciting. This is an exciting time, actually, for, for this filtration system. Because when I, when I first looked into it 15 years ago, there was hardly any scientific research that was applicable to the, to the end. And so I was really going out on a line. In fact, I, I, had, uh, I had to reference an article by Joel Bear from 1974 that, that Joel Bear was involved with. And, yeah. uh, So I lost you there. Uh, primarily, there's, the, there's, there's a group of about eight scientists in the, the, the uh, Netherlands, uh, basically based out of Amsterdam, that have just jumped into this topic full bore. Uh, you know, three of them did PhD dissertations right on cryptic cavity sponges and their, and their consumption of dissolved organics. It's a whole new thing. Um, And you know, this was in the last 10 years, so it's all new, new information uh, and all that. Um, but, and, uh, and what they've done is they've actually gone in and they've, uh, they've, they've quantified uh, some filtration rates of the actual cryptic sponges. So I now have metrics I can use and establish, which I'm putting in the book, that will tell Aquarius you know, exactly what they need to do as far as how many sponges for their filtration needs. So that's all been uh, very 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 exciting you know so this is a really cool time it's a perfect time to get the book out with all this this new information but basically the scientists studied uh, cryptic cavities and it's really cool because the cryptic cavities the size of the cryptic cavities that they're studying are just small little caves anywhere from little tiny caves anywhere from 10 gallons on up to 150 gallons so they're actually exactly like the cryptic zone in, in volume and size and they went ahead and they quantified these caves they, they closed them and they saw how much the sponges consumed or the, the, the heterotrobes consumed of the water volume. So I've got all this data now that, that I could use. It, it was perfect data for me. So it's the, uh, so now basically there's a ton of science, not a ton, but there's a lot of science behind it. And it looks like it's going to be an integral part. It's well, it is an integral part of the natural reef system and it will be an integral part of science going forward. Do you uh, think that uh, so the cryptic sponges would basically take the place of things like a, like a uh, protein skimmer and uh, any kind of reactors you might need in your your SBS uh, reef tank? Is that, is that correct? Well, basically, they replace the skimmer and they replace carbon. Uh, they are consumers of dissolved organics. Okay. Now, the loop actually is this: the dissolved organics produced by the algae get consumed by the cryptic sponges. Most of that is incorporated in, into the sponges and the internal bacteria, and a small percentage is released as inorganic nutrients. So that the sponges do release. Some of the people have said, well, the sponges are going to release inorganic nutrients, but you know, so do fish. I mean, every heterotroph releases nitrogen in the form of ammonia, you know, so, but that's what the sponges do. But the good thing about the sponges is they actually uh, release a small percentage of what they consume. And so. Uh, so, uh, so basically, you're replacing the, the protein skimmer and, and, and carbon with with the sponges, right? And they don't really re, they don't their uh, end cycle is not as bad as say the the slime and all the other or dissolved organics in the water that the, that, that we find in our aquariums to try to deal with uh, skimmers and carbon and all kinds of other stuff like that, right? Yeah, well, they there there actually is a feedback loop too that seems to be pretty important uh, because the sponges basically 
also release a little bit of particulate matter. Um, so they take these dissolved organics, which are only really usable by bacteria and a little bit maybe amino acids can be absorbed by the corals. And they can, they ended up incorporated into their sponge tissue and they also release um, particulate matter, which uh, in the form of uh, expelled sponge cells and, and detritus. And that turns around and, and feeds the detritivores and uh, some of the particulates will actually become bacterial aggregate particulates and they'll be eaten by the corals. So there is, and of course the inorganic nutrients that the sponge release will actually um, fertilize the algae within the coral. So I know people like to say, well, I'll feed my fish to feed my coral. Well, if you got cryptic sponges, you don't have to worry about it. The sponges are feeding the coral uh, automatically. So you'll need less food in this situation. Now, the question is, you know, will nitrogen and phosphate uh, build up over time? Well, if phosphate builds up over time, that is your problem, okay? Because the only way phosphate can come into the system is by you adding it. Now, nitrogen is a different story because it can be uh, taken out from gas and uh, basically brought in by the algae. The algae bring nitrogen in as, a, as, a, as an organic. But from what I have found, it does, if you, if you uh, limit the time, and, and you can always harvest the sponges just like you harvest algae. And you can harvest, you know, you harvest the sponges and for the organics that we're taking up. Yeah, we got a nice little thunderstorm coming through right now. And uh, I'm sitting here at Starbucks, but and, well, luckily I'm inside. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so there's a loop there um, and all that. You know, the only, so the only sticking part is you have to be a little bit worried about nitrogen buildup over time in the form of uh, nitrates. But you just limit your food input. You should be okay. And as long as you keep the loop in balance, it should not be a problem. Yeah. The only other problem would be, um, you know, how to find them, you know, how to acquire the sponges. Yeah, how would how would you acquire these sponges? Uh, uh, are they are they grown in live rock or, or what's the best way to, to find these? Do the dealers have them, or can you, through uh, importers or what? What's the best way to get to the cryptic sponges? And how would you use them in your tank? Would you put them in your sump or? in uh in the tank itself or what would that what would that entail well multiple chapters in my book <laughs> but uh, as far as that's how right. to use it <laughs> that's what the book's now, about basically uh basically you go on sponge hunts but people don't realize that there's sponges in their systems right now no matter how hard they try to keep them out i mean i've got pictures of uh from monaco showing sponges in in uh, in the rock underneath the corals in the Monaco Aquarium, you know, so there are sponges everywhere. Um, uh, typically, though, in the exposed zone, which is your brightly lighted coral area, uh, they don't do well because there's the, the current's too strong and they get they get algae over overgrowing them if they're in light and they can get a lot of uh, de uh, detritus clogging clogging up their pores. So they, they live there, but they don't do well. But what you do is you, is, is you can harvest them from an existing tank by looking underneath the rock. There's a whole other world on the bottom of your rocks. And uh, cutting them off and putting them down into a specialized habitat or zone where uh, the physical parameters are designed to promote their growth. The other way you can find them is on in live rock bins that have a live rock sitting in them for a long time. Look at those rocks way down at the bottom of the bin. Some of those may have sponges. You can find them on the bottom size, bottom side of freshly imported live rock, but the sponges typically are pretty messed up and they'll die. You know, or you could buy seed packs, uh, which people like me sell. I don't have a lot available. We've set up whoo, lightning, but uh, seed packs. And um, I don't. I don't. I'm going to try to ramp up so when the book comes out, I can provide more. But right now, I'm producing about one a month, so it's not. I, I can't obviously supply supply the hobby by myself. So hopefully, other people will do this, and we'll get people producing seed packs. And it's kind of cool because you can produce an item to sell from your coral, you know, fragment fragments of coral, and you can produce items to sell from your filter, fragments of uh, sponges and uh, other uh, organisms. And the other way, of course, is to acquire maybe some deep water aquaculture rock. You know, Florida was, I have to check into it, but Florida was producing some really nice deep water aquaculture rock that was just covered with all kinds of cool cryptic animals because it was kept down deep. Hopefully they are still producing that. And uh, in the future, as more people learn about this, hopefully more people will sell the cave sponges. But typically the sponge you see down at your store, right, at your local reef store right now, it's not the one you need. It'll be the blue haloclona, which is a exposed zone sponge, or it'll be one of the the, the thick uh, rope sponges or something like that. And uh, they typically are not the, 
the they're, they're not they're not the cryptic cavity sponges. Right, and a lot of those sponges have uh, problems of uh, shipping them in, and they get if they get exposed to air and stuff, it can mess them up. Those uh, exactly. orange ball sponges and stuff. A lot of times they'll come in uh, to a uh, LS, LSF and uh, they'll be look like they're alive, but actually they probably already died by the time that you've gotten into your tank. You know, and they'll start getting the algae all growing over top of them, and that's they're not really a good thing to have in a tank if you don't have them shipped properly or they haven't been collected properly in the um, in the hobby. That's for sure. That's that's what I've found in the past. Well, the, well, the cryptic sponges are very, very easy to keep. Just put them in the right. right zone, and they will grow. They will grow. They don't have those problems. That, uh, that those right. sponges. So you should always keep them underwater. So you plan on uh, releasing this book in January, right? Yes, that's the. Yeah, ter, it, yeah I'm going to try to. It's it's a lot of work though, but I'm going to try to. That's what I'm primarily working on the next three months. That's good. Um, so the other topic we had uh, was just you know just a. A short thing because I know we've, after following you on Facebook, we've had numerous of conversations about uh, SBS bugs and pests. Just a little bit about that. Uh, do you want to talk about maybe the the SBS spiders that, that you found in the uh, this past year? You you had numerous posts on Facebook about the SBS spiders uh, and and issues with that. You want to talk about that for a few minutes? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, the, the history of the uh, the parasite problem goes back to like the late 1999, you know, area area, early 2000s. We first ran into acropora eating flatworms, and then it was uh, montipore eating nudibranchs, and then it was red butt bugs on the acropora. And but in the last uh, two years, we've had a couple new ones come out. Uh, there are actually nudibranchs that eat acro, acropora eating nudibranchs. We're starting to see more of those come in. And of course, the sea spiders. Uh, now, the sea spider situation. Uh, basically, it, it was it was a fiasco when we ran into it. Uh, this particular situation. I was I was brought in as a consultant, hired to help someone open up a new reef store in California, big big reef store, and uh, they were going to supply that reef store out of their facility with fragments, and they were an importer. One of the major importers out there. I'm not going to mention names because we don't want to bring any uh, lawyers in, into the situation. So, but uh, they um, they imported lots of acro. They had high end acro, and they were sitting on about uh, fifty to one hundred thousand dollars worth of frags that they were going to send up to the store for the grand opening. And I was involved with getting them ready and all that. And and while we were looking into the situation, we determined uh, I, I happened to see something. Well, I was noticing that frags were dying, okay? Acrofrags shouldn't be dying, okay? But certain frags would die overnight all of a sudden, and it just got me thinking there's, there's something going on in the system. And they had always had particular problems in certain systems with, uh, with, with acro. And so I actually happened to see, I was moving an acro around, one of the frags around, and I actually happened to see something come off of it. And it kind of like floated in the water like this. And I'd never seen anything like that before. So right off the bat, I thought, wow, wow, what is that? You know, so I thought maybe it's a sea spider. So then I was then I was able to grab another frag, and I... I got a sea spider to come off of it, and I was thought, wow, it's just a sea spider. So I went and examined it, and I found uh, a sea spider. And this was like in a, in a frag tank up in the front of their facility. So then we investigated, investigated, and found, wow, there's a lot of sea spiders up here. And then, so we started worried about that. And then we started noticing back in the back of the facility where all these 100 to, 50, 100 to 200 awesome SPS frags were getting ready for this new store opening, that we went in there one night, after after dinner and we used a flashlight a white flashlight and we saw literally thousands of sea spiders crawling up from underneath the plugs up on top of the acros at night to eat the acros and i'm the total amount of ac uh, spiders there was probably a million i mean if you count all the little babies it was, it was just off the hook so it was a major infestation so you can imagine the trouble this caused for the store opening it, it just was a big fiasco I ended up being stuck in California for six weeks because of this. And uh, basically my relationship with them is just gone. Uh, uh, basically I cut it off, they cut it off. We just, let, let's just disappear, you know, let's just separate, you know, and just get this behind us and forget about it. But but going forward, um, we I, I talked to somebody from Indonesia and it turned out that three holding facilities in Indonesia were infested with sea spiders. Now this is secondhand info, so I can't verify it. Um, and then I've heard that they're coming in from other areas like Australia and stuff. So 
what we saw there was basically the beginning of a major infestation coming into the whole captive market. Um, and since then, I've heard that like a store, a store was infested and all that. But it turns out there is, uh, we found out that there's an easy way to treat it. Basically, basically what you do is uh, interceptor can, can wipe them out. Interceptor can take them out. Yeah. Uh, but so you have to double or triple the. Are they a, you have to are a, a particular species of? Uh, is that a crab or is that a? What would you call? What would be the species of? Uh, the, of the sea spiders? Um, it, it actually it's kind of it, it's not a crab. It's not a crustacean. It's it's actually its own kind of thing. Um, it 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 is. Um, I have to look into that. I haven't really uh, researched it that much. Because uh, hopefully I don't ever have to deal with it. Again. But uh, but if you want if you want to get into more detail, you know, further podcasts, we, I I can look into that, find out what kind of uh, animal it is and all that. That's right. it. Just something that comes in my mind. You know, what kind of a animal is this? And uh, of course, in the in the hobby, we were dealing with something that doesn't have a predator to uh, to remove the, the spider from the system. So that's why they just explode and expand to the point where they're uh, really a major problem. Like you said, Interceptor was the uh, the drug of choice in this situation, right? Right, or, or dipping the corals, but uh, we ended up killing a lot of those frags by dipping. Um, I wasn't in total control of the situation, so the dipping procedure wasn't the best in the world for the coral, but uh, because of the store opening, we were in a really big, big, Bind. Now, I never saw them in my facility, but by the time I got back after being stuck on the road for six weeks, you know, my, my tanks pretty much were hammered and water evaporation and everything, basically. Uh, I, I had to go, well, I went three months without acro. But uh, if you got them, um, multiple treatments of Interceptor at, at two to three, uh, at, 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 at at least a double dose seems seems to get them. Um, I know if you dip them, iodine kills them right off the bat, but uh, that that is the best way if you're going to dip them. But uh, the best thing to do is prevent it from coming in. And they're still out there because I just talked to somebody who bought somebody here at local in Abilene who bought from a wholesaler. And he had a, a, a coral colony that was that had sea, infested with sea spiders on it. So they're still out there. They probably have gotten into a lot of facilities. Um, and, you know, the chorus has to be super concerned about it. Right. And, and most of the distributors are so busy packing and moving corals in and out that they're not going to really notice something like that, you know, they're not going to notice it being an infestation until it's so bad they can't miss it, you know, and um, then it's all over the well, country. Right, exactly. See, the, the, the collectors and the, and the exporters primarily cannot treat their coral, and the reason is because you can't stress a coral before you ship it. I mean, that it's just going to make shipping much more difficult. I mean, if they did that, they'd have to wait a month before they could ship the thing, and then it's going to lose color in the holding pins. So they have to just ship it through. If they find an infestation, they basically have to clean out the system and just let it be dry for a few days and then start over. Um, but, yeah, so uh, because of that, it's going to get into the import facilities, which it has in some import facilities. And uh, if they're aware of it, they can help prevent it. What you have to do is find the exporters that are exporting it and tell them they are exporting it, have them purge their systems, clean them out, you know, but you, there's always going to be the possibility that one lone coral could come in with it. So you have to dip with iodine nowadays. It's very important. That's, that's the, and then look for any sea spiders that come off in the iodine. That's great. What's your first thing you recommend is an iodine dip uh, with uh, how much, uh, how much iodine per, uh, say, uh, uh, for whatever in a in a container would you recommend well i'm 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 a old school guy on that i just do it by eye uh, basically because i found iodine dips will will only hurt a coral if it's super stressed i mean i've i've left healthy corals and iodine dips for half an hour maybe a couple hours and, and, and they were fine um what, what uh, basically basically you just make it till it's the color of uh, tea that's that's what I do because as you use the iodine over time it gets used up and it will lighten the color so if you use the color you know not coffee not coffee we're talking tea you know um, but uh, and I basically haven't dealt with the sea spiders in my facility so I haven't been able to sit around and quantify it all, um, yeah. into uh, recommended dips but just look up Lugol's dip 
But if you want, we can get into these specifics further on, and I can go ahead and uh, find out what the recommended Lugol dips are. I could test them out on some frags for you and all that. Um, but uh, as far as dipping goes, I'm a guy that just does it, does it by eye, by feel, <laughs> as far as the concentration. Well, you know, if, you, if you know the right amount of color you want to get, it works out just fine that way, you know. But um, that, that would be good. And uh, I wanted to also bring up at the end here, we're going to be seeing you here in another uh, – Another few weeks here in Louisville at uh, November 21st, we're having our, our choral show with you and a bunch of people from all over the country coming in at the November 21st, the Louisville Coral Farmers Market Show. And uh, we're all happy to have you up here and have a big party with Steve. And uh, one of the things we're going to do with the uh, SBS Insider Show, we're going to show you how to uh, actually introduce your coral into the tank as far as uh, how much, how slowly we need to put it, and that kind of thing. And Steve's going to give us some uh, tips on that. Uh, and that'll be a live show, me and him recording it together in one place and not in a Starbucks and meet up in my office here. So, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so we'll who knows what's going to happen? We won't have, <laughs> have storms going on. <laughs> no storms. So, uh, no storms. We've got a few uh, all beverages around, too. <laughs> that's right. Many adult beverages and all kinds of stuff going on up here. And we recommend anybody that's in the area to please come by and uh, see Steve and see all the different corals we'll have here. And I uh, appreciate you all coming out. And, uh, Steve, I hope you don't have too many more storms here today and don't get struck by lightning today on <laughs> the way, way home. So I want to thank everybody. Uh, thank you for your time, Steve, and I hope everybody had enjoyed the show. And we look forward to talking to you all again in, in, in a few more weeks. See you soon, folks. Bye-bye.